Genesis 15, we'll pick up at verse 1 where we read, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Then Abram said, Look, you've given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. The chapter begins with God summarizing perhaps one of the most incredible adventures in the life of Abram in three words. After these things. And I never cease to be amazed at how we can take a short story, especially as preachers, and just go on and on about it. But I imagine when Abram came back from pursuing and recovering his nephew Lot, and if you weren't here with us, here is exactly what happened. Lot had moved towards Sodom. There were four kings that had come against the five kings down in that area. The five kings had rebelled against them. The four came, took them captive, took all their stuff, captured Lot and his family in the process, and began to move away with them. Abram, hearing the news, armed his household servants, about 318 of them, if my memory serves me well, and pursued them over 120 miles to catch up and then another 100 miles before the whole deal was done. So at great personal expense, at great risk to his own life and such and his own people, he pursues, brings back Lot, brings back all the, the goods, brings back all the people who'd been taken captive. No record of anyone in his group dying in the process. And so I imagine they'd sit around and tell this story for days about the military strategy, how they divided their troops and they attacked by night and they overcame. Then upon their return, he meets first with the king of Sodom who offers him this incredible reward. Just take all the stuff. I only want the people. And he refuses all that. He meets with the king of Salem, Melchizedek, the king of righteousness king of peace. And this king of Salem blesses him, shares in the first communion service in Scripture with him, receives the tithe from him, and God simply says, after these things. You know, it's sort of like, well, it was a big deal, but what we're into now is equally important. So these words are after these things often summarize major events, be it in the life of someone or something doctrinally. You'll find them appearing regularly in the book of Revelation to, to say, you know, these things go down and then after those things go down, these things begin to go down. But in the midst of all of this, we see a couple of things that should encourage our hearts today. The first of them is rather obvious or should be Great victories, times of mountaintop experiences, are often followed by seasons of doubt. Seasons where we begin to recognize our vulnerability. When we realize, man, I, I, yeah, I succeeded, but I made some enemies in the pro process. And that's what had happened with Abram. See, it was one thing to hear his nephew was in trouble and to arm his servants and to go and to challenge those kings and to bring back all of the people and all of the stuff. But now he gets home and as they're telling the stories, he realizes, man, I was at peace here and now there are these kings. And, and you know, they had captured this whole deal. They're going to be after me. And so he goes from this high, high to this low, low. And I watched it happen in my life. I've seen that happen in other lives. It'll happen to Moses. He'll have these great experiences with God and you'll find him just saying, oh, just kill me, Lord. I just can't go on anymore. And, and Elijah, he'll face off with the 450 prophets of Baal. Then he'll go hide in a cave from Jezebel. And so it's human nature. Great victories, great ups, mountaintop experiences, 
often lead us to times of doubt, to depression, to discouragement. And that's what's going on here in the life of Abram. No, what happens is God appears to and speaks to Abram. And what he does is he takes his eyes off of the circumstance. He takes his eyes off of the fear of the future. And he says, hey, Abraham, look at me. Abram, look at me. And so we find him looking at and listening to the Lord. And the first words spoken by the Lord, as Abram has this vision in verse 1, are do not be afraid. Now, I've noticed in my study of Scripture, and I hope you notice it as well, that God never wastes a word. And so we have to ask, why would He tell Abram not to be afraid? And the obvious answer is, He was afraid. There's no reason to say, hey, don't worry if you're not worrying or not a worrier. No reason to say, don't be afraid if you're not afraid. So God seeing Abram's heart, knowing Abram's nature says, hey, don't don't, don't be afraid. Why? Everything's going to work out. He tells them two things that we need to latch on to today. The first is he says, I am your shield. Years ago, when Kizzy, who's now six and was then living with us, uh, first started going through that little phase where she became afraid of the dark. And most of you parents have been through this with your kids. I think she was like two and a half, never afraid of the dark to then, but somewhere around two and a half to three, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she was spooked. And I'd go in and I'd try to comfort her. I'd say, there's nothing to be afraid of. I just sort of doing the, I'm going to get this over real quick and be back to whatever I was working on. There's nothing to be afraid of. Don't worry. And then I leave and, oh, you know, I'm afraid. I'm like, there's nothing in the dark. But I found none of that comforted her at all. And then I realized that it was so easy to deal with this issue if I just stayed by her, snuggled with her, sang to her. Then she was no longer afraid. Why? She knew that I was there protecting her. And so we got in a regular habit of her calling to me. Pam would go in and talk with her and pray with her and stuff. And then she'd cry, Uncle, I need my night-night song. And uh, I'd go in, I'd sing this little, is the coolest, cutest, most wonderful song. My mom used to sing it to me. I'm not going to embarrass myself or you by doing it now, but it's called Hush Little Baby, and it's not that Mockingbird song. It's way better. But anyway, I taught it to Kizzy, and I'd go in, and I'd just hug on her and love on her and sing that song to her, and she'd drift to sleep. And then, you know, a year went by. She memorized the song. I'd be in there. She'd be wide awake. She'd be singing the song to me, stroking my forehead, and I'd be falling asleep. But God doesn't say, don't be afraid, there's nothing out there. Or there's nothing to be afraid of. Why not? Hey, there's plenty to be afraid of. We live in a horrible, wicked world. There's all sorts of things out there that are a danger to us and to our loved ones. But instead, He comes alongside, speaks softly, sings to us, and He just says, hey, I'm your shield. I'm here to protect you. Hey, God tells Abram through Melchizedek that the whole victory was the Lord's in the first place. It wasn't his military strategy, although that was good strategy to attack by night, to divide the forces, make it appear they were bigger and greater than they were. He says, the Lord delivered your enemy into your hands. And that same Lord is saying, hey, I'm here with you. I'm here for you. I'm your shields. And he says, I'm your exceedingly great reward. Now, he doesn't say what I often read this to say. And I just kind of read like you do, sometimes kind of quickly. And I get the idea that God has my rewards. I know some of you think that because I've heard you pray. Now, don't stop coming and praying with this because I said that. But some of us, I can just tell, we think God has our rewards. He's kind of hoarding them or something. And if we can get the words right or lined up or get the formula, then He'll actually bless us with stuff. And God isn't really all hung up on keeping stuff from us or giving stuff to us. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, which will turn out to be the theme of this message, and all these things will be added unto you. The kingdom of God. 
submission to the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, walking in intimacy with our Creator, our Sustainer, our Savior. He says, seek that first. And His righteousness, make sure you're right with Him. And then all the stuff you need all will come along. You won't have to have a big list of all the stuff that you think God needs to do for you or provide for you. See, God isn't our heavenly Santa Claus, as some really imagine Him to be. Uh, He's not a genie that we just kind of command and get three wishes. No, He's our loving Heavenly Father. He knows what we need before we ask. He's just waiting for us to acknowledge that He is the supplier of every good and perfect gift. But He says, look, I am going to protect you, and even better than that, I am going to be with you. He promises not only protection, I am your shield. He promises His presence. And if there's anything that will bring comfort and hope and joy to our lives as we walk in this world is knowing that, hey, God is here with me. That He doesn't leave me. He doesn't forsake me. He's not frustrated. He's not angry. He loves me. And He delights in me. And He's here for me and here with me. So, He doesn't say, I have your reward. He says, I am your reward. The context of that, of course, is that Abram had turned down the king of Sodom's suggestion that he keep all this stuff. He says, I am not going to have any man say, I made Abram rich. I... I'm witnessing to you that I am serving the true and living God. He'd taken opportunity to bear witness and, and he wanted the king of Sodom to know that God was the one providing for him. And if he was rich, God made him rich. And if he was poor, God had him there. But it was all going to be God. Well, then he goes on, as we've seen in, in, in those verses 2 and 3 and, and 4, to ask some fundamental questions as it relates to some of the promises God had made. Now, he's feeling better about his situation and his relationship, so he figures, "Uh, maybe I can get a little insight here, Lord, and I want to encourage you. If you have questions, concerns, don't hesitate to go before the Lord. Hey, come talk to us. That's fine. But first, go to Him because, see, we only know a little bit. He knows it all. And so you can go to Him. He promises to give you wisdom. He promises to give it liberally, without chastisement. He doesn't say, why can't you get this figured out? He gives you what you need. So he comes and he says, well, what will you give me seeing I go childless? And and I've got this heir, but he's just one of my servants. See, he was troubling over the fact that God had promised him in Genesis 12 this great and mighty nation. And he promised that through that nation, Messiah would be born. A seed would be born to him through whom all nations would be blessed. And uh, some of you heard or used the term biological clock. I hear, you know, gals who aren't married and they're 30 or 35. They're like, the I hear my biological clock ticking, you know. Well, Sarah was 65 when he got the promise. So no doubt she'd heard the clock ticking or it had wound down and stopped ticking. Abram's 75, and and they're sort of doing this whole thing by faith. Okay, God's given us a promise. That's going to be awesome. But we'll see in our next study that God not only waits a year and two and five and ten, but He just waits and waits and waits. He's in no hurry to fulfill the promise. Is He going to fulfill the promise? Absolutely. He's got to be faithful to His Word. But at this point, Abram's not questioning that it'll happen. He's only saying, hey, how and when? And God isn't troubled by the questions. He says, look, I have no offspring. I've got a servant who's going to inherit all this. And God says in verse 4, this one shall not be your heir, but one will come from your own body. He'll be your heir. And he brought him outside. I love this. First, he says in response to Abram's fear, don't look at the enemy. Don't consider the situation. Don't look at the circumstances. Look at me. And listen to my word. I'm your shield. I'm your reward. Now he says, well, how am I going to have this great nation? And where is this family going to come from? He takes them outside and he shows them the stars. I love this imagery. He says, look now toward heaven. And I've noticed that in Scripture, 
While we tend when we pray to bow our heads, and I'm not sure that's bad, but when Jesus prayed, He lifted up His eyes to heaven. When Elijah prayed, He lifted up His eyes to heaven. And here He's saying, why don't you just look up? Don't look down, don't look around, don't try to figure it out. Just look at heaven. And as He looks up, it says, He says, count the stars if you are able to number them. Now, I doubt that He was able. I find in another passage God saying not only will Abram's descendants be as numerous as the stars, but as numerous as the sand of the sea. And someone has suggested along the line that the amount of stars out there and the amount of sand here is about equal. Now, I have no problem with that suggestion, but I have no way to prove it. I've never really even tried to count a handful of sand but I'm pretty sure it would be a futile effort. You'd start in the morning, you'd go all day, your hand would still be full of sand. And so there's so much more to all this. And what he's doing is he's saying, look it, I know this is almost incomprehensible. You're not going to be able to grasp the how and the, all that, but I just want you to see what I've done. So he says, look at the stars. And then he says, I'm going to give you more descendants than the stars out there. Well... This is mind-blowing to Abram, but what's even more mind-blowing is his response to it. He doesn't say such a thing could never be or how could such a thing be. Instead, we read in verse 6, and he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Now, he believed. That means he had faith in what God was saying. He totally, though he couldn't comprehend or grasp the how of it, he believed the what of it. And you know, that's what God is seeking from us. I so often want to know, well, how will that work out? And God's just saying, just trust me. Well, yeah, I, I do, Lord, but could you just tell me how it's going to happen? And he's saying, listen, this is what pleases me. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Abram exercised faith. The words for believe and faith are synonyms in Scripture. Abram believed God. He had faith in God. And God put that on his account. He said, that will make a man righteous in my sight. And I want to talk about this concept for a moment of righteousness, of holiness, of, of um, uh, justification. The words righteous or justified are synonyms as well. So when you read in Scripture of someone being justified and Romans chapter 4 talks about Rome, uh, Abram's justification, telling us it was not of works but by faith, that his right standing before God, and that's really all righteousness is, being right in the sight of God, holy, acceptable to Him. And we're going to find that that righteousness, that that justification, that that holiness has got to be imputed by God. And here's why. It's not inherent in any of us. There is nothing I can do, there is nothing you can do to make ourselves right before God. That's why if you later, and do it later, go to Romans 4, and you'll see that he uses this example and says that though Abram was a man of works, his works couldn't justify him before God. Now, if you've been studying with us, you know some things about him. This guy was an altar builder. And I want to suggest to you that every altar Abe built testified that God was holy. But not one altar built by Abe ever made Abe holy. Every sacrifice offered on the altar testified that God was holy and Abe was sinful, and sinful man cannot approach a holy God apart from sacrifice. But the sacrifice didn't make Abe holy. If it did, we're told in the book of Romans chapter 4, that then it would have been by works. God would have said, hey, good altar, nice sacrifice, you're holy, you're righteous. But he didn't say that. He said Abram was justified by faith. Abram was justified how he believed God and God put it on his account and said, that's what's righteous in my sight. That makes you holy in my sight. That makes you acceptable in my sight. 
So Abe was a worshiper. He was an altar builder. He was a man who walked with God. He's called a friend of God. He was a witness for God. But none of that made him right or righteous in the sight of God. He was a religious guy. We know that. He later would initiate, or God would initiate with and through him this rite of circumcision, sort of a seal of the deal that he makes with him a little later on. And so some later on in history said, well, you know, we're circumcised, so we must be righteous. And in the latter part of Romans 4, he points out that, listen, Abram was justified, declared righteous, declared holy before he was ever circumcised. So it's not about religion, and we'd have to liken circumcision to any religious exercise we might get into. See, today circumcision is mostly a, a medical procedure in our generation. But in those days, it was a spiritual issue. It separated out a group of people, the circumcised from the uncircumcised. But he says that's religion in it, its finest. Religion that's obedient to the Lord, doing what God says. But it didn't justify him. It didn't make him holy. It didn't declare him righteous. And then in Galatians chapter 3, he says it's not the law. And so if you happen to be a person that's trying to get right with God and you're, you're doing it by trying to do good works, you know, you've done a bunch of bad stuff and you figure that out. You know you're a sinner. So you said, I know. I'll do a bunch of good stuff and I'll balance the scales. And, and believe it or not, if you aren't doing this, there are people really trying. They're trying to balance the scale. Like if they can just do a little bit good, better than the bad, then they'll be acceptable to God. But God is looking for a righteousness that matches that of His Son, who we're told was tempted in all ways, yet without sin. So how much good do you have to do to atone for the sins of the past? There's no amount that can ever do it. God wants the scale not just tipped in the righteous direction or in a good direction. He wants perfect holiness, perfect righteousness. And we don't have it. And we're not going to attain it by works. We're not going to attain it through religion. We're not going to obtain it through the law. And neither did Abram. And that's what he's pointing out to us here. This is sort of a foundation. It's a fundamental issue. That's why we're dwelling on it a bit. He says he believed in the Lord... And God accounted it to him for righteousness. Now, I grew up thinking holiness or righteousness was something I wouldn't want anything to do with. And here's why. My very first concept, my first visual, if somebody said, what's a holy man? My picture was some monk out in a monastery, you know, living in absolute, you know, destitution. You know, they've got nothing living in the middle of nowhere dealing with nobody. And I was thinking, if that's a holy man and that's what I perceive holiness to be, well, it wasn't really a great inspiration for me to want to be holy. Because I had no interest in a life of isolation, living in some monastery in order to have a holy life. And that happened from about ages 10 to 14 or 15. And then the Beatles came on the scene. And of course, they introduced my generation, those of us over 30, um, they, they introduced us to the Maharishi. Some of you won't remember him, but basically what happened is, is the whole deal was if you could sit cross-legged, which I found extremely difficult and, and uh, very painful, but if you could kind of get in this lotus position and ohm out and uh, you know eat the grass and goo and just go along with the whole program, you would be holy in the sight of God. But you know... The Beatles discovered what I discovered. They wrote a song about it. It's called The Fool on the Hill. That song is a tribute to Maharishi. See, they decided the guy's just sprouting nonsense. Just spouting. He's probably doing both. Spouting nonsense is what I meant to say, but sometimes, you know, you make a mistake and it's better than what you were going to say. So, if your concept of a holy person, a righteous person is a person, is some monk in a monastery or some Maharishi out in the mountains, you need to know that every person that believes the Lord, that trusts in the Lord, that yields to the truth of the Lord, God declares holy. God declares righteous. So today He'd say to us, Look at the stars. Look at what I've done. Consider, I'm with you and for you. I'm your shield. I'm your 
your protection. I'm here personally with you. I'm all powerful. Look at the stars. There's nothing I can't do. And so is there a promise he won't fulfill? And my suggestion to you is there can't be. He will always be faithful to his word. So he says in verse 7, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to inherit it. Well, that brings up another question for Abram. And I like it. He's just sort of saying, hey, while I've got your attention and I'm recognizing your presence, can you explain this one to me? He says, how will I know that I inherit it? Now, some people read doubt into this, like, I just don't see how that can happen. I don't think that's what he's saying. He's saying, what can you show me that will make this part make sense? Maybe it will help you to realize God's promised them this mighty nation, that God's promised them Messiah will come forth from it, who will ultimately be the Redeemer of all mankind, all who will trust in Him at least. And at this point, Abram doesn't even have his first child. So he's saying, I'm going to give you this nation and hey, here's all the land you're all going to live in. And he's saying, well, <clears throat> could you explain to me how? Uh, could you give me a little further insight into this whole thing? And so he tells them, OK, take a heifer, three year old heifer, a three year old female, go to three year old ram, a turtle dove, a young pigeon. And he brought all these to him. He cut them in two down the middle, placed each opposite the other, and did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, he drove them away. Now, what's taking place here is something that was coming in their culture. God is actually coming down to man's level so that he can give Abram a sign that he'll be able to relate to and relate to others. And if you're not familiar with this whole thing, it's because you don't live back then. See, what we do, if we're going to sign a contract as we go, we get a lawyer and they write it up and then we have a notary notarize it and we file it somewhere, you know, and, and that's our contract. What they did in those days is they got animals and they cut them in two and they lined them up and down the side and then they walked toward each other. They came in there and they kind of clasped hands like this. And we got this very graphic picture, if you will, where what they're saying in essence is, if you don't keep your part of the bargain, may you end up like this. No kidding. That's what was happening. In other words, if you're not faithful to your part or I'm not faithful to my part, you're dead meat. And that's exactly what they were standing in between as they made the agreement, as they signed the deal, made the covenant. Now, this becomes interesting to me as a Bible student because... There was really no walking down that thing. See, this is a different kind of covenant. In fact, God is going to be the one who initiates. God is going to be the one who establishes this covenant. We're going to see before we conclude, it's one-sided and unconditional. So Abram doesn't walk down. They don't clasp hands. They don't do this whole thing. But what we do have is a picture of God saying, this is how it's going to go down. And this is how you can be sure there's going to be a sacrifice. You can look at the sacrifice. Surely, as he said, don't worry about the future. Look at me. Don't worry about the, this other stuff. Look at the stars. Now he says, here's how you can put your heart and mind at ease concerning my promise to you. Look at the sacrifice. And of course, that sacrifice, as all sacrifices in Scripture, are meant to point us to the sacrifice that Jesus would ultimately make on our behalf. The sinless one, while we're dealing with the issue of righteousness, of holiness, of justification, he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. That's what the Bible says. We sing that here. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. So the covenant is established. He says, this is how you can know. When you're unsure, look at the sacrifice. Now note Abram's part in this. He obediently makes the sacrifice. And then he chases away the animals that come, the vultures that try to come and devour the sacrifice. And as the sun was going down, verse 12, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, horror and a great darkness fell upon him. And he said to Abram, No, certainly your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them. 
and they will afflict them 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they will come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace and you shall be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Now there are a couple of things here, very specific, that we need to just touch on because they're not going to be a big deal until you get to the book of Exodus, but this is the foundation for that. He tells them, you will have descendants. You will have the land. You will. You can trust me. Look at the stars. Look at me. Look at the sacrifice. And then he begins to give them specific details. He says, not only will you have descendants, innumerable as the stars of the sky and the sand of the sea, but your descendants will be slaves in bondage in a land not theirs. Now, if you're a Bible student at all, if you've just read the first two books of the Old Testament, you know that's exactly what happens to the children of Israel. But if you've studied maybe a little more carefully than the average person, you might think, wait a minute, there, there's a discrepancy here. There's an inconsistency here because I've read it was 430 years in Egypt and this says 400 years. Well, if that's a problem for you, let me straighten it out. For 30 years, they were at peace in Egypt, brought down by Joseph and Pharaoh, who loved Joseph, who had stored up during a time of famine. They were blessed there, taken care of there. And then Pharaoh dies, and a new Pharaoh comes on the scene that didn't know Joseph. And that's when the 400 years of slavery begin. Now he says, they'd be slaves in the land. Why does this stuff matter? We'll get into it in more detail next time. But because we need to know that the promises of God are meant to be taken literally. When he says you're going to have descendants, he did. When he says there'll be slaves, they were. And when he says it'll be for 400 years, exactly. And then he says they'll come out with great possessions, did they? Well, if you've read ahead, you know they did. After that tenth plague, they were given all sorts of gold and every other thing, and they left there with great possessions. And then they went to the land of the Amorites and the other ites that are listed here. Reading this, you start to get the idea that God really doesn't like ites. In verse 19, Kenites, Kenizzites, Kadamites, Hittites, Perizzites, the Rephaim, I don't know how they snuck in, but Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, Jebusites. And basically what he's saying is, this is the land I'm going to give you. All the land of the ites. But there's something that is oh so subtle and yet so important to us as believers and those of you who are yet, who've yet to become believers. And I believe if you're here and you're listening and you keep coming, you will become a believer. I don't believe you'll be able to come and come and listen and listen and resist the love of God and the mercy of God that you're going to hear about week after week and see demonstrated as you get to know these people. But know this, he says, it's going to be 400 years, not because that's how long it'll take to discipline you, but because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. If you've ever wondered, if you've asked, if someone's asked you, how could a loving God let a world like this go on? You know, I ask myself that same question every day. But it's from a totally different vantage point than the average person asking the question. See, they're saying, if God's love, why is the world so bad? And I'm saying, how could a loving God let us trash our world so badly? You see, some people see starving children and they come to the conclusion that God's evil. But you know what God says? Our hearts are desperately wicked and deceitful. It's not Him that's causing children to starve. We have the resources to feed every child on the planet. It's the sinful heart of man that causes people to starve and die. It's indifference to the suffering of our brothers and sisters throughout the world. That's what's really going on. And so the question isn't, if God's loving, why? It's like, how could a loving God let it go on? Here's why. He says the iniquity isn't full, but He will judge. Can we be sure? Oh, yeah. Every judgment in the Scripture points us to the reality of coming future and total judgments. The book of Revelation tells us that God will judge this corrupt, wicked, and Christ-rejecting world. But for today, there's opportunity for repentance. And I want to suggest to you that entire 400 years, there was opportunity for the Girgashite and the Jebusite and the every other site or ite. They could repent. 
They can hear that there's a true and living God. And check this out. When they go into Jericho, there's a gal living there, not of the highest moral character. The Scripture tells us she's a harlot. Her name is Rahab. She protects the spies that come to spy and check out that city. She asks for mercy and, and asks to be protected. And they guarantee it. She and her family are saved among this entire city of people that are destroyed. But check this. Not only does God save this harlot Rahab, she ends up in the genealogy of our Lord and Savior Jesus. He puts her in a place of prominence and says, hey, here's a trophy in my kingdom. An ice that heard it, that got it, that believed it. He may have been waiting the whole 400 years just for her. And I want to suggest to you, if you've wondered, why does God let this world go on as wicked as it is? We're told by Peter that the Lord isn't long-suffering or isn't. But that's not what he says. It says he is long-suffering. It's been a long day and Pam's gone. I'm starting to whine. But, uh, it says the long, Lord isn't slack concerning His promises, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing any should perish, but all come to repentance. That's the deal here. You see, He wants you to have His righteousness, to possess it, His holiness. He wants you to be justified. He wants you to know, you to know what it's like to be dealt with just as if You'd never sinned. And we use that play on words to help remember what it means to be justified. God deals with me just as if I'd never sinned. But it's imputed. How can you have it? He says, believe God. Look to Him, not the circumstances of your life. Look at His power, His creative ability, His, uh, uh, his creation itself. And then look at the sacrifice. Jesus said, if you... Don't believe I am, you will die in your sin. Don't believe I am. He's saying if you don't believe I am who I claim to be and I've come to do exactly what you need me to do to die for your sins, and that is what Jesus came and did. If you don't believe, he says, you'll die in your sins. But if you do believe, You'll be justified. You'll be declared righteous. You'll be declared holy. So here's what happens in verse 17. It came to pass. It's another one of those phrases. After these things, it came to pass. When the sun went down and it was dark, behold, there was a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. The Bible says our God is a consuming fire. I would suggest to you that God appeared there, even as he would later appear to Moses in the burning bush. He established his covenant. They didn't walk toward each other. They didn't clasp hands. And here's why. It was a covenant established through sacrifice. And it was a covenant that was unconditional and one-sided. And I want to suggest to you that that's exactly the kind of covenant we've entered into we who are born again of the Spirit of God, forgiven all sin, alive in Him, we have this new relationship. We're able to worship acceptably. We're able to sacrifice acceptably. We're able to walk with Him and witness for Him because we trusted in Him. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but by His mercy. It's His shed blood. His sacrifice for us. And if all of this is new to you and it just seems strange and foreign, you just got to hang with us. Keep coming. Come, keep studying. But if you've been around and maybe you've resisted making a profession of faith, giving your life to the Lord, know that the very picture given to us here is fulfilled in the person and the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That covenant established with Abram was established through a substitutionary sacrifice consumed by the Lord. And Jesus, as He hung upon that cross, died in our place, shed His blood, 
wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace upon him, and by his stripes we read, we are healed. It was unconditional, this covenant, and it was one-sided. He didn't say, Abram, if you'll do this and this and this, then I'll do this and this and this. He just said, believe it. Receive it. It's a gift to you. Romans tells us if it had been his works, it wouldn't have been a gift. It wouldn't have been grace. And so today, God points us to himself. And he says, do you believe that I'm your protector? Do you believe that I'm present with you? Look to the stars. Do you believe I'm all-powerful? Look to the sacrifice. Do you believe that I'm forgiving? That I've made a way? And if you do, then know this. Man, so much lies ahead. So many wonders walking with Him. He may summarize it all in and after these things, but we'll be telling the stories the rest of our lives. And if you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus right now, we're going to bow our heads and we're going to pray. And every believer is going to pray that God would soften you and speak to you and that you today would find His forgiveness and receive His imputed righteousness. Lord, I thank You for my brothers and sisters. I thank You for the work You're doing in us. As day by day in our studies of Your Word, week by week, month by month, year by year, You are confirming, Lord, what we only hoped and dreamt of that you are a God who loves us and is for us and never leaves us or forsakes us. And Lord, I pray that you'd encourage my brothers and sisters here today. There are so many things that happen, Lord. There are so many times where we take our eyes off of you, where our circumstances lie to us, where our situation trips us up. And Lord, I know you're wanting to lift us above all that and say, look at me, look at the heavens, look at the sacrifice. And Lord, I pray for any and all here who've never given their lives to you, knowing full well that the same sun that melts the butter hardens the clay. Lord, we pray that not one heart would be hardened, hearing these things and turning from them rather than responding to them. Have your way, Lord, in every unbelieving heart. Bring them to faith in you. Help them to see the truth. Your love and plan for them. Your Son crucified for their sins. Buried and risen again. Lord, help them to open their heart even now. Enable them to see their need for you and your plan and love for them. And if you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus, while every head's bowed, every eye's closed, I'm asking every believer to be praying now for any in our midst, for all in our midst who've never received Jesus as Lord and Savior. You know, it is true that if you harden your heart hearing God's offer of mercy and pardon for sin, cleansing and restoration, that every time you hear it, it's it's a little bit more difficult. Am I saying God will never get through to you? No, I don't believe that. But I am proclaiming today is the day of salvation. If you hear His voice, if you can get past me, To know God is speaking to you through His Word and by His Spirit. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Believe in the Lord and it will be accounted to you for righteousness. You'll be declared just. You'll be declared holy. Not of works. Not of religion. Not of law. But by faith in Him. And if that sounds good to you, I want to give you a chance to receive Him as Lord and Savior right now. If you'd say, Sam, pray for me. I have tried so hard and I've given up hope. I realize I'm never going to make it. But this whole thing, if it's true that I can be forgiven and declared righteous by His work and not mine, oh, I want that. If today you want to be forgiven every sin, 
You want the righteousness He imputes, forgiveness He promises. I'd ask you to raise your hand and hold it high, and I'll pray for you. And on the authority of God's Word, you'll be forgiven every sin. You're slate wiped clean. If you were to die tonight, you'd be ushered into the presence of God and He'd welcome you, arms open. You'd hear the words, well done. And you'd think, what did I do? And you say, you believed on me and in me. And I accounted it to you for righteousness. Anyone here this hour, anyone struggling with this decision, hey, give it up. Give it up. If you're thinking, I don't know if I'll be able to follow through. His promise is he who begins the good work, and he has begun it, will be faithful to complete it. If you're thinking, I already did the religion thing and it didn't work for me. This isn't what that is. This is about life eternal and life abundant. The gift of life. Anyone at all. God bless you, sister. I see your hand here in the front. Others here, if you're not sure yourself. Anyone else want to join this sister and say yes to the Lord Jesus for the very first time? Lord, you tell us there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. And Lord, we know that for us to be declared just, for us to be declared righteous, we have to keep our eyes fixed on the reality that not only were you crucified for us, but we were crucified with you. And for this sister, Lord, we rejoice. And Lord, we pray that as she opens her heart to you, as she confesses her need of you and her acceptance of you as Lord and Savior, that not only will you seal her as you've promised, but you'd fill her to overflowing with joy and peace and that her life would become a living witness to your life-transforming power. And you who raise your hand and any others who want to pray along, pray these words aloud after me. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me, for choosing me, for sending your Son to die for me. Thank you for showing me my hopelessness in my helplessness to make it right on my own by my works by my efforts and thank you for imputing to me perfect righteousness complete holiness absolute justification Teach me, Lord, day by day, all you'd have me know. Guide and speak to me. Direct and use me. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's welcome this sister into the family.